Welcome everyone. I want to invite you to one of our virtual artist tours and interviews with Michael K. Paxton. He's an amazing artist and we've had the pleasure of having him as part of the Evanston Art Center family since 1996. He taught for a year and then through 97 and then in 2000 he was part of a three-person show. And from then, he's been in and out of shows throughout the decades. And we're very excited that he's going to have a one-person show at the Art Center in February, March of 2021. So we're here today to visit him in his studio, and he's going to tell us all about his work, his life, and his future life. Cara Feeney, our Director of Exhibitions will be interviewing Michael about uh, all of his great work. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, so we can go ahead and jump right in. Um, Michael, so our first question for you is how did you begin making art and what inspired you to pursue a career in the arts? Well, it's, it's kind of an interesting story. I was, I didn't have any kind of art instruction in secondary school in West Virginia. I grew up in uh, Southern West Virginia and it was, you know, the secondary education was spotty at best and, uh, and there was no art education at all. So I was actually, I drew a lot as a kid, you know, copying cartoons and, and then my parents, when they'd go to the grocery store, would buy like a pad of paper and I would draw on it and, and so I actually was in journalism in high school. I was the editor of the school paper and I do cartoons, you know, uh, political cartoons. So I went to, you know, I, I was not the best of high school students. And then Marshall University was uh, the local university there that, I, that a lot of people went to. And so somehow I went to go sign up and the journalism line, there was a lot of people in the journalism line. There was nobody in the art line. So I just signed up for art. And that was the best thing that ever happened to me because uh, Miss Kilgore, who was the becoming the new chair, mentored me throughout my life until she was she passed away, you know, back in 2006 or something like that, you know. And I stayed in touch with her all my life. Early on, when I had the show back, I was I was known for doing figurative work, and I quite successful and had a lot of shows and museum shows of that. And, and I had a big show that was at the cultural center called From Enoch to Strange Creek, which was all about, it was, it was sort of a huge insulation of 50, 50 canvases, uh, but they were all figurative and animals and things and, and things that I grew up with and family members and, and all that kind of stuff. So I had done that for a long time. You know, I started out with, uh, workers because I as a I had to drop out as a freshman in college because my dad had a heart attack and the man up the road worked for the railroad and he wanted to know if uh, I needed work since dad was laid up and uh, so uh, I said yeah so they let me get out of school because I had been doing pretty good in my drawing classes and they thought I'd, they said go ahead and go on it was a bit about this time of year and uh, uh, and so <laughs> I showed, I showed up this camp car that, that was a, you, you, they had a dining car and a shower car and a bed car. And so I was at 19, I was on the, with a bunch of old rough men out in the middle of the woods living like that. And we laid track by hand. And so, and I made enough money from that to pay for my school the next year and to, and to buy a car because I didn't have a car. And, uh, and so, and then the next two years after that, I cut right away up in the mountains for an engineering crew that were, was building an interstate where, where, where there was no road. <laughs> it was all through the mountains. So I, that's how I paid for my school. But when I got ready to start talking about West Virginia, the first thing I did was I started making drawings of people laying track, cutting, you know, doing manual labor like what I had done. And, and also I had worked a lot of factory work. You know, I, I, when I graduated from undergraduate school, there wasn't anything to do, you know, so I got a job building roof boulders for coal mines where they, these big machines where they drill, and hold the roofs up. So, and that's, and then I painted at nighttime. And, uh, uh, 
you know, I would paint it in like a little alcove where you came in like a little mud room to the apartment. And I put my drawing table in there and I, and I did this work for a year and a half. And that's what got me a fellowship in graduate school. So uh, I think, I think that kind of, you know, I, 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 I teach a lot of students and I talk to a lot of people and, and I've always found that uh, people who really spend their lives being artists, <laughs> there's nothing that focuses your mind about being on the middle of the Grand Canyon on a tight wire and <laughs> being too far out to go back and you have to keep going forward and nothing focuses your mind about there's no net and you have to keep going. You know? And I think that's, that's sort of been what has kept me going all these years. It's, it's amazing I've made it this far. You said that you uh, began really with drawing and sketching. Um, has your practice um, evolved over time from that drawing and sketching, or is it still something that you do pretty regularly? I, I would think that drawing is the foundation of everything I do. I think even with the paintings and things, I, I think there's uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of time filling up sketchbooks like this is the one for yeah i mean i've got like six i've i've probably done 60 drawings in the last four weeks in sketchbooks i filled up two two sketchbooks so i start thinking about an idea and i just keep fleshing it out on these with these pen and ink on these sketchbooks and then i use these as 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 the, how i blow up the paintings you know so and and i start with chalk and charcoal and uh, I think one of your questions was about the technique I use, which is very unique to me, is that I, instead of putting gesso on the canvas, I, I, I wash it, I, I, I take a little bit of dish soap and a gallon of water and I coat it like that and it takes the sizing out of the canvas. And then I can draw on it and then I can get it wet and instead of it going through the canvas or staying on top of the canvas, it, it's, it, it, it's embedded in the canvas. And then that's, that drawing becomes the basis of how I start building the painting. Is there, um, I feel like sometimes it's, it's difficult to go from a, a small sketch to translating it to like a 10 foot painting, which I know your pieces are really large. Is that yeah. a difficult transition to me? Well, I, 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 the way I do it is, is that I, I would stand back. I have, I, you probably can't see this, but I, I measure it out so that it's, these are all eight foot by six foot. So I measure it out. Uh, so ra uh, ratio wise, this is, this is what it is. And the, I, so I stand back as far as I can and get my, get it so that it's even. So I stand back in the studio so that it, this is the same size as my canvas. And then I point, to where I want to put something, and then I run up on the ladder and I put start drawing it in like that. And over the you know over thirty years of working that way, I, I've uh, it, it it's more I use that drawing as sort of the foundation or the structure on which I build the work. So and then and then I still make those big charcoal drawings that are like uh, six foot by fifty inches. So I I I I, I enjoy the, the act. The act of drawing, I guess, is, is the best way to say it. I wanted to make big work because I think I like them being more of a place than a thing. You know, there, there's a lot of visual. There's a lot of thing about distance in the work. Uh, I think someone uh, uh, somebody wrote about my work one time and said, the, the further you get away from it, the closer it is. So it, it's playing with space a lot. And it's also, I think, uh, I making them big. I don't really know what I'm doing, <laughs> so it's always a struggle, and uh, uh, and and so that keeps me going. You know, I can I can draw, you know, because I teach drawing and painting. I I do a lot of demos, so I keep my hand going. But I I'd like to have something that's that I really are struggling with. You know, it keeps it kind of honest. Is this piece um, behind you, I think when we had emailed, you said that it was a, a new piece that you've, you've been Yeah, this is on? a whole new series. This is, uh, uh, I, I, 
actually, this was kind of like the direction I was thinking about some of the work to put in the, the show in October. So I was kind of, I, I, I had a couple of false starts on these big ones because I hadn't, you know, I wasn't sure where I was going with these. And I found these structures uh, that are, uh, you know, they're like, they're interesting kind of, I, it's hard to see them, you know, but there's, there's you know, they're, they're um, oh, they have all different kinds of things going. I wanted more space in the work. You know, I, I wanted more color and I wanted more paint and I wanted more space. I felt like the, the black lungs, I had kind of taken that as far as I could and they were a little flatter and I wanted to start thinking a little bit more about depth. And, and, and actually with this extra time I've had, I spent two weeks on this painting, which is a long time for me. I mean, every day coming in here and fighting it. And so I've really layered the paint a lot more and, 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 and thought about the color and the space and it's a weird shape. So I fighting it all the time and it seemed to be, it, it gave me a new kind of thing to fight, you know. I felt like if I kept doing the black lungs, I would just, same thing I did with the uh, Enoch to Strange Creek. I, at a certain point, I felt like I was becoming a parody of myself, you know, after I talked, made a lot of artist talks and had a lot of shows with it and visiting artists at universities and things. I felt like, you know, I felt like I was, you know, I was a chatty Cathy. You could just pull the string and here comes the stories. Here comes the next stories. And so I, I think when I started, I wanted to break away from that. So I started doing absolutely non-objective things. I had no drawings, nothing. I just started making drawings. And I'd spent years doing that. And as slowly as I got going, I, you know, I felt like I needed more something structured to hold it together more. And then after Portugal, I had a sketchbook full of all these drawings. So I used those. And then that's got me the black lung. Now it's got me to these, you know, so that's generally how painters think. <laughs> they, 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 they follow something and then it peters out. And then the next thing they, they look for something else that's sort of like that, but pushes it someplace else. It's a, it's, it's a crazy way to, to live, but it's, it's my way. <laughs> So do you have any artists that inspire you um, and influence the way that you work? Well, I would think that, you know, over 45 years or better of making art, I have soaked up as much art painters as I can. And, and it depends on, you know, like I've been looking at Turner. I've been looking, again, Turner was always somebody I was always interested in just because of the way his surfaces. And, 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 and I've always been interested in him. Uh, uh, but you know, it goes all over the place. I was looking, I, I had met, uh, Philip Guston in graduate school. He came to, uh, Lane de Kooning was the chair when I got my fellowship and she brought Philip Guston in to give a talk and I met him and, and it was one of the best talks I ever heard in my life about an artist. So you said that, um, you're a professor and I'm wondering, do you ever, I know um, I was a painting student and I was really influenced by my professors in college. Do you ever feel the reverse of being influenced by some of your students? I, I think that I think the, the, the greatest thing that's happened to me and, and, and probably the biggest influence on myself is that I probably learn more from my students than they learn from me. I, I, hope, I hope that's the case. You know, there, I, I, and also since I don't have any children, we don't have any children. I, I, I they keep me kind of in this, in the, in the moment, <laughs> in the, you know, in 2020 and not back in 1971 or something like that. You know, I, I, I think the most important thing I, I try to tell them is that quantity breeds quality and not the other way around. That sketchbooks are books of solutions waiting for problems to happen. So they should keep an active, they should look at how the world is put together. That's where, and, 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 I, and I tell them at some point in their life, you'll get them to the point where you need to bet the farm on yourself. And I said, if you can't bet the farm on yourself, then why should anybody else bet the farm on you? And I think, I, I say that, you know, so it doesn't mean you're gonna win. I said, I bet the farm on myself three times. And the first time I lost, 
and then I had to lick my wounds and I came back and the second time I did I got you know and 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 and, it, and I think that 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 sense of that at some point you have to go all in on 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 yourself and on your work and 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 take the lumps that comes with it because if you don't do that then you're always going to be you're always going to be failing backwards instead of failing forwards and and the only true way of of advancing anything in your life i think is the to 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 fail forward in other words fail for trying to do too much instead of being failing because you were afraid to to make a mistake i mean my whole life is <laughs> is built on a mistake <laughs> and also i think uh uh, uh well i mean I, it's most of it, i think as a teacher you try to give them confidence that that's okay what you're doing, you can't you can't edit while you're doing it. Just do it and see where it takes you. You know, stack them up and look and see what what you've done and figure out what's working and not working, and then quit thinking and go. You know, I try to tell them to work from the eyebrows down. And if you if if you're if you're thinking, you're probably not working. You're thinking about how bad it is, or thinking about how good it is, or thinking about something else. But if you're just an eye and a hand, and 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 you're in it. Uh, what was John Cage's great statement is that when you start a painting, you start with everybody that's ever talked to you about painting or ever read about painting in the room. And as you work one by one, they leave the room. And if you're lucky, it's just you and the painting. And if you're real lucky, you leave the room. And I think most people are looking for that point where, where we leave the room, where all of a sudden you did something and, you know, I have no idea how I did that, which is which is the fun part.